Bonjour, World History 2 scholars. Comment allez-vous? Je m'appelle Mr. Deegan. Welcome to Unit 5, Rise of Nationalism. We are starting with Lesson 1, the French Revolution, with, which is why I'm speaking French once again. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about the end of the absolute monarchy in the country of France, and that means the end of Louis the, and the separation of his head from the rest of his body with this device called the guillotine. Why did this happen? Because the people of France rose against the absolute monarchy. Let us venture on with our study. We're going to be taking notes on page two and page three of your vid notes today. First, our guiding question to guide our study. How can tensions with a country's social classes lead to trouble? Let's find out. You see the tricolored flag, the blue, white, and red of France. This flag was the product of the French Revolution. When was the French Revolution? It was after the American Revolution. It started in 1789 and it ended in 1799. And the causes of this French Revolution were twofold. First, the American Revolution. The French saw what the Americans were doing against the British and they wanted to do the same. And also the Enlightenment, a period of reason in France when new ideas were being thought up about how best to run a government. Let's dig a little deeper. The ideas of the Enlightenment. You see another French salon here. And you see some of these Enlightenment thinkers who are going to cause the people of France to think that they can rule better than one king. Montesquieu says, to become truly great, one has to stand with the people, not above them. A king stands above his people. So that might spark a revolution. Rousseau, another champion of the Enlightenment, he says, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. Life is making him shackled when he has natural rights. Rousseau is going to spark the French Revolution. And an American, imagine that, a Virginian no less, Thomas Jefferson, he's going to say the strongest reason for the people to retain, meaning to keep the right to bear arms is to protect themselves against tyranny in government. Tyranny, meaning when one person or a small group of people take complete control of a government. Jefferson is saying that's not a good thing. In fact, that's grounds for rebellion. And Thomas Jefferson also writes one of the most beautiful documents in world history, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths, he wrote, to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you're an average French person and you read this, you are inspired to do something about your own plight. And that's what happened in the Enlightenment. That's a cause of the French Revolution. Another cause was the American Revolution. You see a battle scene here. The American colonists were the first in the New World to gain their independence. And the Americans rejected the British Parliament's right to rule them from over the Atlantic Ocean. And since British King George III, the ruler in Britain was a tyrant, the Americans could no longer swear allegiance to him. So July 4th, 1776, Americans declare their independence. And the Americans defeated the British at the Battle of Saratoga, New York in 1777. That was a signature victory for the Americans, and it showed Europe that the Americans could win this thing. And it convinces France specifically that the Americans deserve an ally. So Benjamin Franklin goes over to France and negotiates an alliance 
with the French there, and the French join the American Revolution. And the British finally surrender to the French at the Battle of Yorktown. The French are very important to our victory. And this causes the French people to be inspired. It also causes debt. Wah, wah. Three times their national income was the bill. 1.3 billion livres. One cause of the French Revolution was the American Revolution for both good and bad reasons. Okay, let's talk about French society in the late 1700s. It was unequal. Why? Because there were three different classes, three social classes. Let's crunch some data on these three estates, the social classes in France. We, we talked about the clergy making up 0.5% of France. These were the Roman Catholic leaders. They owned 10% of the land and they were exempt. They did not have to pay any taxes. The second estate was the nobility. This was French royalty other than the king. And they held the high ranking positions in government, in the French military. They were also exempt from paying taxes. No taxes for the first two estates doesn't seem fair. And the third estate was 98% of the country, 27 million Frenchmen and women. It was everyone else. And the first and second estates lived off the labor of this third estate. They carried the burden for the entire country. And they were mostly rural wage laborers with some bourgeoisie, the wealthy, educated, urban members as well. Now you know the three social classes. You also need to know that in France, during the late 1700s, there was tension between these three estates. And let's talk about this. The catalyst or the spark for the French Revolution was this tension. And the tension starts to build because France is broke. There is a drought in France that is causing a wheat shortage. When you don't have wheat, you can't make bread, people are hungry, and the French government is in debt because it spent so much money in the American Revolution. So the king's response is to hire a new finance minister. The minister's name is Necker, and Necker chooses to solve the issues of France by having the first and second estate pay taxes for the first time. And Necker also restricts the power of the king's counselors and court. Well, the king's response to Necker is to call the estates general to meet. It's the first meeting since 1614. More than 150 years have gone by with no meeting. But here they go because the government wants to find solutions to this crisis. So this estates general meeting has some rules. Rule number one, each estate gets one vote. The second rule is that they're going to work to fix this crisis. The third rule is that the third estate sits in the back. So here you see a painting of this very meeting in 1789. All of the estates wanted to argue about the organization of the estates general and not about real issues. Sounds like politicians. Here's what happened. The third estate walks out of this meeting, and then the king locks them out of their meeting room. So they moved next door to a tennis court, which might have been a handball court, but it's called in the history books the Tennis Court Oath. And what does the third estate promise to do in this room? They promise to keep meeting until they have written a new constitution among themselves. They are the ones carrying the burden for the French society. So after they write this new constitution, most of the nobility and a small chunk of the clergy join them. And Louis' military surrounds Paris and the Palace of Versailles. They start to get nervous. And July 11th, Louis, the king, fires Necker because he's the people's favorite. And on July 14th, a spark 
is lit. The people are in need of gunpowder because they want to defend themselves with the king surrounding them. And they storm a building called the Bastille in Paris. Let's take a look at what it looks like. This castle-like structure is a prison, and it is called the Bastille. On July 14th, 1789, this prison is stormed. This event is the French equivalent of the Boston Tea Party. It is an old prison, more than 400 years old, and what happens when the regular people in France storm this prison? 98 of the rioters die, two of the prison guards also die, and prisoners are freed, seven of them. And this event marks the beginning of the people's revolt against their royalty. More on the storming of the Bastille. Here's another picture of it. You see the commoners about to storm it. 800 Parisians assemble outside of this prison. A guard fired on the crowd and many people were killed as the mob broke through. Let's talk about the politics of this time. Again, there's tension in social classes. There's also tension among politicians. So the National Assembly in France was the major meeting house. And you have the left wing, the National Party, the centrists, and the right wing, just like you have today in American politics. So, so the Jacobins, they are the left wing of the French government in the 1790s. They are a group of extremely liberal politicians. They are led by the revolutionary named Maximilien Robespierre. And Robespierre and his fellow Jacobins are revolutionaries. They want to get rid of King Louis the 16th and establish a republic, a government elected by the people. Meanwhile, in the middle, you have the National Party. Their goal is more of a British style monarchy where you still have kings and queens, but they share power with the parliament. And then you have the monarchians. They want no revolution. They want things to stay as they are. They want King Louis XVI and all monarchs to stay in power. So those are the different powers at play. What happens? Well, the radical Jacobins take control and Maximilien Robespierre rallies the people to his side and he gets the centralists to agree with him. And then the king starts to get worried. So he and Queen Marie Antoinette, here she is known for her very extravagant and outlandish haircuts. They disguise themselves as servants and they flee and head for the eastern border of France. But they are caught because a man recognizes King Louis XVI by looking at his coin, looking back at King Louis, who's in a coach, and saying, oh my goodness, that is King Louis. So he is returned, and the queen is returned to Paris under armed guard, and he is put on trial, and the Jacobins find him guilty of conspiracy against the public liberty, and he is beheaded publicly. And the rest of Europe is horrified by these radical Jacobins taking control and beheading their ruler. And about a year later, Queen Marie Antoinette faces the same fate as her husband. She is beheaded. So here is a picture of the beheading of Louis the 16th. When does it occur? In January of 1793. Why did it happen? Well, the people were upset with his abuses of power, including his opulent, meaning extravagant lifestyle. He was very disconnected from the plight of the people. While the people were starving and had no bread, he would rather go out on a hunt. So why is this beheading important? It brought to an end the absolute monarchy in France. But the question was, who is going to replace the monarch? And that's when the reign of terror starts to happen. People start to get paranoid. There is no real person in power right now, but there are all of these revolutionaries 
who want to kill all of those who are loyal to a king and to the monarchy system. So 40,000 people die during the reign of terror, this radical violent stage of the French Revolution. How do they die? By this device called the guillotine. Now, this guillotine, an average guillotine, weighs about 1,278 pounds. The blade itself weighs 88 pounds. It's about 14 feet tall, and the impact of it was about 888 pounds per square inch. This was a monster of a device. And it didn't kill who you might think. In the last 132 days of the reign of terror, there were more than 2,000 people who were executed. And this pie graph shows you the type of people by social class. The vast majority of the people executed were members of the third estate. But weren't they the ones who were fighting for freedom? Why would people fighting for freedom kill members of their own? You knew that the reign of terror was getting out of control when this was happening. There was a positive outcome to all this violence, however. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. This was France's version of the Declaration of Independence. It gave rights to the people, and it gave Robespierre that republic that he wanted. Let's just take a look at the first two pieces of this declaration. Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. The aim of all political association is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, and security. Huh, sounds an awful lot like Jefferson and like John Locke. However, there was still a power vacuum. After the reign of terror, you had to have someone bring stability into France. And the man who did was a military hero during the French Revolution. He fought against the monarchy, and it is this man on this white horse. His name is Napoleon Bonaparte. And amid the chaos, he helps turn France around. And he becomes the emperor of France in 1804, crowning himself the emperor. Now we have but our summary questions left. Please work on those now. And here's a preview of next lesson. We're going to delve deeper into the life of this man, Napoleon Bonaparte. How does he change France? Does he change it for the better? Or does he concentrate power all to himself? You'll learn about that in lesson two. Until that time, this is Mr. Deegan signing off.